Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Ari Gerson with Longfellow Books. Um, and we're here to celebrate the release of Elizabeth Lett's book, The Ride of Her Life, the true story of a woman, her horse, and their last chance journey across America. Those of you who don't know her, Elizabeth is the number one New York Times bestselling author of The $80 Champion and The Perfect Horse, which won the 2017 Penn Center USA Literary Award for Research Nonfiction. She's also written the novel Finding Dorothy. Her books have been Indie Next, Library Reads, and Junior Library Guild selections, and a Good Reads Reader's Choice finalist. Elizabeth will be joined in conversation by David Howard. David is a journalist and the author of nonfiction books and magazine stories. His most recent book is Chasing Phil, The Adventures of Two Undercover Agents with the World's Most Charming Con Man. His first book, Lost Rights, The Misadventures of a Stolen American Relic, chronicled the 138-year journey of an original priceless rendition of the Bill of Rights that was pilfered during the Civil War. Publishers Weekly called the book a remarkable American story and a marvelously compelling read in a starred review. Um, just a quick, a couple of quick technology notes. Um, if you could please stay on mute during the course of the conversation, that would be wonderful. Um, and there will be an opportunity for question and answer at the end of the talk. Um, you could submit your questions via the chat um, and uh, those, will be, those will be reviewed and hopefully selected. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to David and, um, and thank you both for being here. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Ari, and uh, thank you to Longfellow Books and to the MWPA for hosting this. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight to talk about the ride of her life with Elizabeth and uh, learn more about the story behind this remarkable and moving story. This book is a travelogue, a fascinating slice of American history, and an adventure yarn that feels like a Greek epic poem. Annie Wilkins is a near penniless 63 year old Maine farmer who's on the verge of losing her land to back taxes. She's alone and has just absorbed the prognosis that she has as little as two years left to live when she embarks on a cross country journey with her dog, her horse, and few possessions beyond the layer of men's clothing that she piles on in order to survive the bitter winter. The plan is that there is no plan except to try and find her way to the mythical California sunshine by relying on her animals, her upbeat and trusting nature and sheer grit. There's hardship and sadness and adversity and there are countless moments of grace and providence and personal triumph. And in this eight golden age of anti-heroes, it's really refreshing to spend time with a character who is so unambiguously easy to root for. This book not only sates our hunger for adventure, it also soothes our souls. And it's many moments of random kindness make us feel better about this country and the people in it at a time when it's not always easy to do so. This is a character and a story that will stick with you for a long time. So I guess the obvious place to start, Elizabeth, is you're an equestrian uh, and you're, so you're far more likely than the rest of us to have discovered this story. But this one easily could have been lost to the mists of time. And um, tell us how you managed to intersect with Annie's story and what drew you to her. Well, first of all, thank you for that lovely introduction to my book. I just, it makes me happy that you responded to it that way. Um, yeah, so it, how did I find her story? Um, by accident, which is pretty much how I find the majority of my stories. It's usually because I'm researching something um, else, and I find something um, around the margins that seems more interesting than what I was actually looking at. Let me just hold up my hand. I broke my thumb a few days ago horseback riding, so when you see me gesticulating. Um, so, so I was researching, and, and it's funny, I don't remember what. I was looking at a newspaper, and I like horses, and so anything with a horse will immediately catch my attention. And I saw this picture of this woman sitting on this horse. She was um, actually wearing men's clothes, looked like several uh, layers of clothing. She had uh, a horse who had things tied on him every which way. And it, the caption of the photo was California, here I come. But the dateline was South Sanford, Maine. I thought, well, she doesn't look like she's gonna make it 
out of Maine, much less all the way to California. So I just wanted to know, most of the time, you know, you see a little picture and you can't really find anything. But as I started to dig into Annie's story, I realized that there really was a story there. Um, and so that was a lot of fun. And let me see if I, I believe I have the, the actual picture. I'm gonna see if I can uh, share it with you guys, the one that caught my attention. Um, yeah. I've been really curious to see. Here more of what you know what she looks like and yeah you have a great way of describing that you know she, this is sort of like left in the early november right in maine in the central maine yeah she left in november which just to me is like <laughs> what was she thinking <laughs> but she was from maine so she should have known better okay can go. you guys see this picture yep Okay, this is Annie. This is this was Annie. This was the picture that was actually taken. Uh, one of the pictures that was taken in South Sanford, Maine, when she was just setting out. And some of the things that you see here that are really fun. Um, I talk in the book about blanket rolls. So no sleeping bag. Um, so she rolled up blankets and tied them to her saddle in the back. She was wearing a. Uh, she was riding a what's called the McClellan saddle, which was they used to be just everywhere, and they were military cavalry saddles. Um, kind of very, not really an English saddle, not really a Western saddle. They had kind of more English style stirrups and then they, the, but they were very stripped down because they were designed for, uh, you know, going on marches and not putting a lot of weight on the horse. And uh, she had kind of modified the saddle a little bit to make it lighter. And then she just tied things on it. So we have her, um, I, you know, you see what she's wearing. She's wearing obviously several layers of clothing. Um, and then she's got her, this is an army navy surplus coat. It was a navy, a navy coat. Um, and then she's got all kinds of saddlebags. The one thing she said she bought was a Sears and Roebuck uh, saddlebags, the ones that hang over the horse, and you can just kind of barely see it right there. So this was the this was uh, ca the California Here We Come picture. And then the thing you cannot see in this picture though is um, there's a little line coming off on the uh, the horses forend at the end of that picture but cut off is certainly Depeche Trois, her dog. And um, tell us a little bit about the horse because the horse is not necessarily the horse that you would choose for this kind of journey, right? If you were picking a course to walk across the country, you might not choose a former, for example, a former racehorse. Yeah. Well, here's the thing that's kind of interesting. So um, I had the, uh, the great pleasure to be interviewed to do a discussion like this one um, when the hardcover came out with a man who is uh, Denny Emerson. He is uh, from Vermont and he's one of our most distinguished equestrian, Olympian, etc. And I asked him the question and I said, um, you know, do you think, I mean, because Tarzan, her horse turned out to be extremely sturdy. And I said, do you think he was, she was uh, it was just good luck that the horse was so sturdy or do you think there was something about the horse and he had he had seen some pictures of the horse and everything and said I think that really she picked a good horse without meaning to she didn't know she was going to but uh, most horses really wouldn't be able to be that loaded down and go all the way across the country like that and not and not to uh, suffer more than than he did so but yes but temperamentally that's the funny thing so he was a trotter he was a morgan horse um and morgans are kind of the state horse of of maine but also in the course of my research i found out that uh, essentially the morgan blood was you start talking about northern new england so not just vermont but also maine um uh, upstate New York, that whole region. I mean, they said one in five horses was was at least in some way Morgan. They were bred to be incredibly versatile. So you could um, pull logs with them when you were logging the forest. You could ride them to church on Sunday and you could race with them. And so, so a lot of the country trotters, there was a very, very popular um, races uh, in New England at the time, which were carriage races. And so you could race the horse, they had log pulling contests. That was the stock that Tarzan came from. So he actually was a very versatile horse, but his temperament was, uh, you know, not exactly suited to getting out on the highways and, and, and riding alongside trucks and things because he was afraid of trucks. So. Um, and um, the third member of the party, we should not neglect to mention. Um, of course, if you're traveling across the country on a horse, you naturally want to bring along a small dog to uh, pull on, a, have a leash, tangling mm -hmm. everything up along the way, and um, pull us a little bit. Depeche mm -hmm. Trois, right? Yes. So her dog Depeche Trois, she was. He was. Um, 
actually not very old. I think he was 14 months old when she left off. She had adopted him from some of the local boys. So he had a French name because they were the, um, you know, this is obviously the area around Lewiston, Auburn, where there are a lot of uh, native French speakers. Depeche Tuan meaning hurry up. Um, and he was a, a, you know, a mutt of unknown origin. She had adopted him and she brought him with her because she was, he was her best friend. Um, he knew nothing also about, he had never been on a leash before because he was a country dog. And so she put a collar on him and put a, tied a long length of clothesline and they were constantly, I love the stories about them, you know, Depeche would start chasing something around a tree and the next thing you know, she'd have to go and unwind herself uh, by walking the other way. So that was the trio. You had a horse who was uh, actually very sturdy and a really great horse, but actually not particularly trained to go on a long country, cross country ride. You got the little dog, he was very game. And then you've got Annie, just, um, you said, you know, her plan was not to plan. She had a sixth grade education. So she knew how to get to the next town over and she knew that California existed, but she had most likely never seen a map of the entire country in her entire life. Or if she had, it would have been a long time ago in primary school. And that's a great point. Um, one of the things that amazes me of reading this book in the age of Google Maps is just that she left home, literally rode out of her town without really even knowing much of the land, what she was headed towards beyond the next few towns. And um, didn't even really seem to think that that was a major problem. It was just kind of, she was moving at a very slow pace and could interact with people along the way. And um, it's, seems like the kind of thing that would uh, almost in a way will never be replicated because mm -hmm. now we're also so plugged into things. Yeah, what's fascinating about, about history, writing about history to me is, I, so the 1950s, this period of time, this was around the time that my mom graduated from, from my mom and dad graduated from high school. The 1950s, I wasn't alive then. It doesn't, it doesn't seem so distant to me. It's not like writing about the Civil War or something where it's really a long time ago. Um, it feels recent. And as a historian, when you go back and you, you take yourself back into that world and you, and you immerse yourself in that world, all of a sudden you start to realize how different it is. You know, you, you really are visiting a place that no longer feels so familiar in, in a million little different ways. Um, and, and one of the things that fascinates me about history, and so I'm sure because you also do this kind of, of story, is that um, you have to look at, let's say you have a person who's, um, who's 63, that was Annie. Annie's 63 in 1953. So she, there was a lot of life that went into Annie before we got to 1953. She was also living on a rural road um, in a small town where she had, the life had not changed maybe as much, definitely not as much there as it had in other parts of the world. So when you looked at Annie, she really had more, almost like a late 19th, early 20th century mindset. Um, so she, that's what she brought to the table. You know, the next town over, she knew some people and then the people in the next town over would know some people in the next town over. And it's kind of as if the whole world is just this one giant neighborhood, which is such a beautiful way to look at the world. Um, but when you look at how things were then, and then you think about what was coming down the pike, which was in particular, uh, the interstate highway. And then you see us on the other side of that. And you think, wow, you know, we were, she was riding into a, a world that was really on the cusp of a very major change. Um, and so that's, 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 I think you're right. Yes, you can, you, you can, and sometimes people do try to ride their horse across the country. They do it with Instagram and yes. GoFundMe and they, they have cell phones and they have GPS and they have all kinds of help. But to do it the way she did it, just to ride out and say, let's go. I can't imagine, I can't imagine having that much trust. It makes you realize that with all these tools that we have, that we've also lost the ability to just kind of say, it'll work out, you know? So um, yeah, continuing with that thought, um, reading this book, I think a lot of people might be inclined to feel like, you know, the 1950s reads like this you know, ancient period, ancient era that um, is so different than what we're um, living in right now. And, and you know, the map mapping um, mm -hmm. uh, example is just one of many. Um, but I noticed that you wrote in your author's note at the end, you were thanking all the people that helped you with your research 
and reporting. And um, you wrote that, uh, you wrote, thank you for reassuring me that Annie's America is still out there. Yeah. Can you unpack that a little bit? It's, is it still one big yeah. neighborhood in a lot of ways? Well, I think, I think I really, I, I mean, I guess that's the biggest question that I've gotten um, having written this book. I mean, is this Mayberry RFD? And I was trying to paint, you know, sort of an idealized picture of, of a past that, in my view, just, just to make it clear, um, I don't believe that 1953 was better than 2022. Um, I don't, because we had, uh, we had Jim Crow segregation. And so just if she had been a Black woman, she could not have traveled the way that she did, um, just, just for starters. So it isn't, we, we, we've got, gained some things and we've lost some things. So my goal in writing the book was certainly not to contrast the, the present moment with um, the past and say, oh, if only we could go back to the good old days. That being said, um, what, what, what you see in the ride of her life, what makes it sort of so soul soothing is that you do see this very high level of social trust among people um, where there is just an expectation that a stranger might be welcomed at your door and not assume that they were going to come to rob you or shoot you or do something to you. And, um, and that I think it's, it's really bittersweet because um, I feel that a lot of the social trust that we've lost in this country is on us. Because when you, when you really start looking at it, think about like uh, an example that I often give is um, wildfires. If you see a, natural, a national, uh, natural disaster or some kind of big disaster, Americans absolutely come together to try to help each other. Or if you really just think about the people that you know and you think something terrible just happened to me, would, would my community come together and help me? I mean, I, they would. So we're, I feel like we are a country of people who, are, who have um, in many cases, this, this sense of mourning over this lost sense of social trust. And we're also busy being worried about these things that very often we don't even, we don't, maybe perhaps we don't, perhaps we were a little too quick to give that stuff up, I guess. Um, and, and I'm an optimist about human nature myself. I am a trusting person. I tend to think that people are gonna treat me fairly that's just my assumption. Um, I also don't watch a lot of TV. I do not consume a lot of TV news. So it's not like I don't know what's going on, but I'm not a fearful person. So um, I feel like those people, Annie's America, yeah, absolutely. I think that we do want to be neighborly and kind and like each other. That is an impulse that is very much alive, but we definitely struggle with it. We do. Yeah, the book, it, it was really interesting. It makes you think about sort of neighborliness. It makes you think about gender because of some of the interesting situations that Annie found herself in. Um, mm -hmm. Makes you think about law enforcement. I was really struck by, <laughs> it's just so interesting that she would ride into different towns with no real prospects or any idea what she was doing or where to stay and would end up just going to the police department and saying, hey, uh, can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, that was one of the most fascinating parts of the book um, to me is that I found out that urban police stations were largely supposed to be homeless shelters. So it's a really interesting um, history there that I knew nothing about. In, in these urban centers, it was known that you could go to the police department and you could get, um, you know, like a hot meal and you could sleep in a cell. And if you hadn't done anything wrong, they would just give you a bed and let you sleep there. Um, and I, I didn't know that. I thought that was super fascinating. But the idea that you would just go to jail, go into town and like the sheriff would put you up in the jail. Um, yeah, I mean, and I could tell you though, interestingly, I have a niece who rode her bike across the country in uh, about four or five years ago. And actually there are still police stations that um, will take overnight guests in small towns for uh, people who are walking or riding their bikes across the country. So I guess there's a list of them. Um, wow. But yeah, that's been. And, and then this idea that they were kind of, um, you know, it's a small town, right? So they're, they're, they were sort of there to, look out for her as an individual. She could come in and, and, and ride into town and the police would be waiting for her and then they would make sure that she was okay. And um, I've done several um, book clubs with uh, groups of police officers who reached out to me having read the book saying, you know, we get a lot, a lot of bad press these days. Here's a book where actually we're doing something <laughs> that we're pretty proud of. And um, so I thought that, that just never ever occurred to me, but 
again, that was one of those things where you feel like, gosh, I mean, it's not so long ago, but we don't think about the police getting the, getting us, but they would still do things. I mean, those, they still provide public safety, you know what I mean? Yeah. So maybe they would if they knew that somebody was riding across the country, you know, and it was one of these things that was being publicized on, you know, a blog or something and the police would maybe, they would still have a convoy and make sure they were safe when they crossed the interstate or something, you know? So um, I'm curious, you know, a lot of times behind every great road trip story, there's a, a great road trip that takes place to enable you to tell that story. <laughs> and I know in your case, you actually, I think ended up traveling about twice the distance of um, what Annie herself covered. And I think yeah. I think she covered about 5,000 miles. So yeah, yeah. Um, tell us a little about your, the, the, your own epic saga of, of researching this book. Oh yeah, well, so I didn't have enough time. The dream was that I would set off, I lived in Los Angeles at the time. So that was the dream that I, is that I would go from North Hollywood and, and do it all backwards. But um, I couldn't, I never, I couldn't get a block of time long enough for that. So I actually did it in segments. Um, so let me go ahead and share some pictures again, um, a couple. So the first one I wanna share is just, um, is this one. Now, do you see, do you see a picture? Or did I do that wrong? Yep, that's a pick, uh, main map. The main, is it a main map? Yep. Okay, yeah. So uh, I was trying to retrace Annie's, Annie's voyage and I was so confused because, you know, of where my, what my first step was, was Google Maps. And I could not get, it, it, where she would say she would go wouldn't, didn't make any sense when I was looking at Google Maps. I thought, why she could, you can't go that way. So finally, I went on to eBay and I started buying these old maps. Here's this one. I chose this one specifically for you guys. Main points of interest in touring maps. So this was the way, you know, these were very popular. I love the main ones because they always have these beautiful illustrations and points of interest and things. Um, and as soon as you started following maps from the 1950s, then you realized that she was more or less just following the main roads because that's all there was, you know, which are now secondary or even often tertiary highways at the time were just kind of the main way to get somewhere. So I went and I got all these maps and I started following these maps. Um, and what I find so fascinating about this kind of travel is that a lot of places that were there in the 1950s are still there, but they're sort of slightly repurposed. Um, so you start, and it's particularly true, you know, the, when you're in, in the smaller towns or the more rural areas, you know, they built something and that building is still there. And you start to be able to recognize like, oh, that's an old filling station. Oh, that's an old motel. And um, it's so fun because it's as if the, the past kind of um, appears right in front of your eyes when you know what you're looking for. So I want to share another picture with you. Um, because this was one of the experiences for me that I thought was just the most fun when I was um, traveling. Um, and this one is, let's see, right here. Okay, so this, I'm going to tell you a little story. This is a postcard, and this is a postcard. When Annie's down in Tennessee, there's a scene uh, that's very dramatic. Uh, I'm mean, sorry, Arkansas. And it, she's, she's um, you know, she's lost track of her horses and she doesn't know what's going to happen. And she's in this place. And this is the place where Annie was. And I am driving with this postcard down this road. So in the road that, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's I-70 that goes across Arkansas, um, east-west. But there's another road that is just maybe like, you know, between 10, 15 miles um, that runs parallel, which is very often the case in the United States, they would build uh, the interstates that were more or less parallel to the main road. But what they were doing was so they were bypassing all the small towns. So you have, if you, if you get off the highway and you drive down the old road, it's just one little small town after another. And because of the way that the economy has worked, most of those little small towns are in pretty, pretty bad shape because the highway bypassed them. So I'm down there in Arkansas and I'm trying to find this place and I can't find it. And I'm on this, off this road, I'm somewhere outside of Forest City, Arkansas. And um, I decide to pull over into a parking lot. 
just to kind of see if I can, you know, get my bearings. I'm going to look at my map and stuff. And I look out the window and it's a, it's a, it's a tax uh, office, you know, kind of like we'll do your taxes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just sort of idly looking at this, we'll do your taxes. And I noticed that, so these old motor courts, you know, they had little cottages. So they would have like the main office and then they would have these little cottages next to them. And I'm looking at and I'm thinking, well, this tax office has all these little cottages next to it, you know, like motor court cottages. And then I, I, I hold up the postcard and I look out the window and I realize that I have pulled up in front of this building. It's just been repurposed and it's painted a different color. And I'm sitting there and I'm holding up the postcard and I'm looking at the window and you just get this crazy feeling. You know, you just like your whole body is covered with chills and you think, I cannot believe, like, I can't believe it. So um, that was the kind of, of thing that happened a lot while I was traveling. I was hunting uh, for things that she would have seen and trying to peel, you feel like you're kind of peeling back the present to peer at this past that you're already so familiar with from all this research that you've done. Um, so anyway, this was one, and this is a very classic kind of roadside court um, of the era, Carl's Court, um, this one being in Arkansas. Um, but a lot of that architecture is still around. So uh, especially you guys are in Maine, so you got some nice small towns. So if you really go looking around, you should be able to find them. That's great. So yeah, because of her, you know, lack of maps, she actually took a fairly circuitous uh, journey <laughs> from Maine to California. And um, to, there was actually this huge V-shaped, uh, yeah. you know, in the middle of the country, as she realized right. she had promised to, to deliver a letter to the governor of Idaho. And yes. then on her way to California, she had to detour to, to Idaho. Um, and, and so did you, did you kind of focus on the highlights, the different points on the trip or did, was it possible to recreate the entire path? She, mostly, so what, the one thing that's interesting about um, Annie Wilkins that made it uh, easier for me to write this book was that she had published a memoir. Let me um, share, I'm gonna screen share. Um, right, again, yeah, that's really Because I have a picture of these two. Let's see where this um i was going to ask you about this because this came out in the in the 1960s right and she yeah 1967 so um so let me go ahead and share this picture with you and it's not a very good picture but it's it's actually very okay I have to, oops it says it, it didn't work let me try it again Oh, all right. Well, I'm gonna. It says try it again in a minute, so I'll try it again in a minute. How's that? Yeah. And what I was gonna ask you about that was that you discovered. Oh, there I did it. Can you see uh, it now? Okay. Is that yes. her co-author? Okay. Yeah. So, so this is actually this picture. Um, you see, it says 1967. This is, and I talk about a woman named Mina Titus Sawyer, um, who was such a remarkable and and really interesting woman in her own right. Um, and. Mina was a, um, well, so, so she, was a, she was a very interesting woman. She was an educated woman and she was a journalist for the um, Lewiston uh, Evening Journal or the one, I can't remember because they've all combined and changed names. But anyway, she was a reporter. She wrote a lot of local interest stories um, and she was educated. She went to Colby College and graduated in 1912, I think. Um, and she, as she adopted two daughters um, as a single woman uh, she wasn't married, but she, because there were a lot of, uh, of orphans, there was a lot of need for adoption at the time because of uh, World War II, or no, I'm sorry, it was, it was during the Depression, I think, I'm trying to think when it was. Anyway, she did adopt these two daughters, and um, she started, she really was the reason that Annie got that publicity in the first place. So she had taken an interest in, in Annie's story. She had written, she had read some tiny little uh, newspaper article in a local paper. And then she had said, uh, she had kept touch with her all the way through the journey and she had kept track of her and Annie kept sending her letters about the trip. So much later, cause you can see this is 1967, they, um, uh, Messany, Annie went up to um, where Mina lived and she, they collaborated, they sort of tried to reconstruct her story. And then they wrote this memoir. 
uh, which was called The Last of the Saddle Tramps. So that was really, um, I was lucky because I found, so one of these uh, two adopted daughters of Mina was still alive, um, is still alive. Um, she's 87 now and 88, I think. And so she was absolutely wonderful. I went and met her and she told me that it was, I could go ahead and use anything I wanted to out of the memoir, but she also was there when they were having, it was, it was sort of over the course of a summer when they were trying to reconstruct her journey. And she told me about how they put the memoir together. So I was able to use this as a primary source, but what was really interesting about it was I assumed that when they mentioned people in her memoir that they would be using real names, but they hadn't used any real names. So when it came, she would say, I went to the home of you know Mr. and Mrs. Jones in, X town. And I would think, oh, well, this will be easy. I'll just go track down Mr. and Mrs. Jones. But they were all, they were all um, made up names. So then I had this moment of like, oh my goodness, this is really gonna be hard to write this book. But because Annie was covered in all these little uh, local newspaper accounts, um, back in those days, it would say, um, a visitor came to town, Mrs. Annie Wilkins rode into town on horseback. She stayed at the home of Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so at 113 Oak Lane. And so that was really kind of my point. That was how I, I went and found people who had met her and really pieced her story together. So it was kind of, but in terms of uh, having a little bit of Annie's voice and some direct quotations and that kind of thing, if I didn't have the memoir, it would have been much more difficult to write the book. And I have gotten some, a few interesting comments from readers where they, um, well, when I say comments, it's usually like an Amazon review. And so, so then you can't really respond to it. And they'll say, there was a real book written by Annie. It was much better. You need to go read the other book. And, and um, you know, there's really no way to explain that actually it really, it, it wasn't written by her either. And a lot of the information that was in that book was, um, was also, was not actually accurate, but it was still a great resource. So. Yeah, um, it seemed like you discovered in reading that manuscript that, um, again, going back to how interesting and different the times were, that that um, she actually, she and her co-author omitted a lot of really significant details about her life. Um, and can you talk about why that was the case and, and kind of how you filled in the rest of the story? Yeah, I'm, and, and that was something that was very interesting to me. So. First of all, and I talk about this in the book, um, she's, she was frequently referred to as the Widow Wilkins. And what was challenging about writing this book um, that you're, you're gonna relate to yourself is that this is a person that, I'm not write, writing about Jackie Kennedy. I'm writing about a woman who had a very brief moment where she was being covered in the newspapers, but in every other way, she really was just kind of an every woman. You know, she was a hardworking daughter of a farmer. Uh, she worked in the shoe factories in Lewiston. Uh, she was a union, unions. Um, and, you know, I mean, the, the number of different kinds of odd jobs she did was just, you know, from shoveling snow to being a fruit seller, all kinds of different things. Worked hard every day of her life. But that's not the kind of thing that is documented. So when it came time for me to try to piece together her story, um, I had some things I could pull out of this memoir that she wrote, um, but it was actually really challenging. And so I went into a lot of, um, I went into her genealogy. I worked with a professional genealogist to uh, bring in her family story. And I, um, I also went into census data. I mean, I was, I mean, I was finding town logs from towns that she had lived in, just anything I could find to try to piece her story together. And what I found about Annie that I thought was so interesting was she was telling the reporters um, whatever, she was telling them the truth. So uh, she wasn't holding back, but, but the more family centered the newspaper was, or especially it was gonna go out on the AP wire service um, and kind of go all over the place. All of a sudden, a lot of her rough edges were polished off. So the widow Wilkins, but actually she was divorced twice. She was a vaudeville performer. She didn't actually uh, mortgage her farm. It was actually uh, seized for back taxes that she hadn't paid. She smoked and drank, um, and which is, you know, I mean, why not, right? But she, but th those were the kinds of things that they were constantly buffing out of her picture because 
in order for, to, for her to be a sympathetic hero in the 1950s, she had to seem like she was clean, you know? And so if she was a smoking, drinking, whatever, uh, d- twice divorced, she wasn't gonna make such a great um, human interest story for the newspaper. Um, so her own voice was really muted very much, um, which I thought was interesting. The, and the other thing you mentioned about is about gender. Um, so she wore men's clothes and it wasn't clear to me. I just didn't, I didn't have enough to go on to really explore whether there was, you know, whether she was trying, was, you know, in, in presenting as another gender, whether that's just the clothes that she had. And so, and I, I, this is something that happens a lot when you're, when you're writing a book, you'll do research for three years, you know, and then the book comes out and the person who had the exact piece of information you were looking for writes you an email and says, I read your book and did you know? So what was so fascinating was a woman wrote to me who was um, a historian who was studying, she was getting like a master's in history. And one of her assignments was to do an oral history. And one of the people she did an oral history of was Doris Slattery, who was the um, postmistress of mine at Maine, who I mentioned in in the book was one of the people that Annie knew, knew Annie relatively well. She was already dead by the time I started interviewing. So this interview took place, I think back in the 80s or 90s time. And she talked about her gender presentation. And she said, you know, she really always presented herself as a man. And I was like, oh, you know, it would have been sometimes when you're writing these nonfiction books, you'll have an inkling or an idea of what you think might have been going on, but you really don't have any way to really can't ask. There's nobody around. There's no one left to ask who could give you a more full uh, explanation. So I thought that was really interesting. And um, that's why. And I had one write to me and she said, well, you know, she so you said she went up to Whitefield and she was a dear friend of mine at Titus Sawyer. Were you just glossing it over? I mean, was this like a relationship? And I said, well, in that case, I don't think so, just because uh, they didn't actually, it really was a relatively short period of time. So she didn't move back and move in with Mina. They just spent a little bit of time together. Um, but anyway, sometimes you have these, these Sometimes history is stubborn and it just will not quite let you pull the page back. And, and, and so then you have to just kind of do the best you can. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the, you know, the AP Associated Press and um, this really struck me in the story that I was thinking sort of before there was viral social media, mm-hmm. there was newspaper syndication and that she yes. started off in this way. I think she didn't, that really surprised her um, that, you know, somebody before she even left Maine this reporter found her, wrote a story. It then appeared in newspapers all over the country. And in what seemed like an instant, she was like a sort of a minor celebrity. And she was, you know, riding into these towns where, you know, the Chamber of Commerce was greeting her, the mayor was waiting with like, you know, key to the city. Yeah. Yeah. How, how yeah. does she feel about that? And how much do you think it influenced her, 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 her journey? A lot. So it's almost like, you know, what happens now with the, the, the beat of a, an eye with Twitter and everything that goes so fast, so fast, so fast, so fast. But for that time, that was that was kind of the beginning of when things were really starting to accelerate. And so I think that people didn't really know, certainly she didn't know um, that her story would be able to spread like that. And so that was really interesting. And I, I gotta tell you, that the thing that cracked me up more than anything in this book is that every time she would arrive in this town, they would throw a parade. And I mean, what is this about parades? Like impromptu parade, we'll just have a parade. Well, I guess they did. One of my people that I interviewed was telling me that. He was like, yep, he was a, he grew up in, um, not in Minot, but near Minot. He was said, oh man, we would throw a parade at the drop of a hat. So, you know, the mayor would get the, they would get word that somebody was coming into town. And the next thing you know, the Boy Scouts would be there and the mayor of the town would be riding through town and that, you know, his his big Cadillac and and uh, the flags would come out and the American Legion would, you know. So I thought that was that was really fun. But for her, yes, I mean, that's what's so interesting about the story because now we're just, kind of we everything moves at this kind of dizzying dizzying speed and you just see this moment it was right around that time the middle of the 1950s when all of these technologies that were going to eventually lead us to where we are now were just getting started they were unsettling then to them and they're unsettling now to us um but if she was going you know at a, at a speed of a walk on a horse we're going at you know what rocket speed or something uh so you can kind of kind of 
I feel like it was sort of, I don't know, 1953, 1954, 55. The more I started looking into what was happening there, I thought this is the beginning of where we are now. This is the moment that where we are now started. And we're now at the kind of like the far end of it. So I found that very fascinating. For sure. I'm gonna ask one more question and then um, we're gonna open it up to everybody else. Um, I, one thing I wanted to ask you about as a non-horse person, I thought mm -hmm. it was super interesting in the book how she had this kind of incredible connection and ability to communicate with her what turned out to be a couple different horses over the course mm -hmm. of the ride. And sometimes you described it as little as little as a flicker of an ear mm -hmm. or there would be these moments where they would communi be communicating in complete silence, even just sort of mm -hmm. like interacting or looking at each other. And um, you tell us a little bit more about how that works. Yeah, well, thank you for asking me that question um, because I guess this, is, this was my third book uh, after the $80 Champion and the Perfect Horse that um, kind of uses uh, a, a, an animal-human relationship as kind of like a way in to a lot of history. And so I'm, I'm, I grew up with horses. I grew up in uh, outside Los Angeles um, with, we had horse property, which means we could just kind of, it was not glamorous, but we kept them in the, back, <laughs> the backyard pretty much. So I've, I've been around horses my whole life. And um, I think if you, don't, if you don't know horses, but you told me you had a dog that was barking, that means you know dogs. And um, horses are really, it, it, I find, horses to be fascinating. They're our oldest domesticated animal, older even than dogs. And really horses and humans evolved together through the millennia. We wouldn't really exist without them, nor would they be the way that they are without us. We are highly, highly attuned to them. And that's partly why even if you're not a horse person, most people find horses beautiful or noble or you know appealing, attractive, because we really bred that into them. So in the case of Annie, Annie was a, was a farm person. She had grown up in the country. Uh, she wasn't a trained equestrian by any means, uh, but she was a person who had this very deep and intuitive understanding of, of animals and, and horses. She would have just grown up, you know, putting the harness on so that they could plow the fields and putting the harness on so that they could take the carriage down to the, uh, you know, into town and, and just being around them. Um, and, and the thing that's so interesting to me about horses and people is it is one of the few species, I think, that we really do speak a third language when we interact with them. Um, and take, you know, like, let's say Olympic equestrianism. That is a sport which, in which you have a rider and a horse who are doing these extraordinary um, athletic feats, both the rider and the horse. And they never say a word to each other. And yet, if you were to ask an Olympic equestrian, they'd be like, we were having a very, very deep conversation. It's a conversation of like touch and feel um, that is very, very, um, uh, you know, uh, if you're fluent in it, it's a very rich language. I, I think perhaps maybe I don't speak sign language, but I feel like maybe that would be sort of like if you could speak sign language or something and we share it with another species. So I think also there are people who, who can communicate with dogs at that level. My dogs are not that well behaved. <laughs> I'm not as good with dogs as horses, but, uh, but that's something that I never get tired of thinking about it. And, and it's really interesting too, because Annie, she herself, not an educated person and her, her, I think her relationship with her horses was very much like, they were like her friends, you know? Whereas I've written about some other people that were more like elite athletes who had these very high level different relationships. Um, and so I really enjoyed Annie because of that, because I feel like, I feel like we can all relate to that, you know, sort of how she felt about her horses, how she read them, how she knew, you know, you know, you know what your dog's thinking, I bet. So yeah. that's, that's the same thing with the horse. Super cool, yeah. Really interesting. Thank you. Um, and let's take a look. Uh, and Taryn, if you want to jump in, do we have anything? Um, somebody, Emily Ecker, asked when I was Googling, I saw a trailer about a movie of the book. What happened to the movie? About the ride of her life? Uh, or the uh, one of my other books? Um, well, it, was there. Uh, was there an option at any, uh, 
Right. The writer for life. No, the writer for life. Actually, um, there's no there's no film in the works whatsoever at the current time. Uh, my other books, um, my other books have all been optioned, um, but the eighty dollar champion, which was my first horse book, was actually going to be, and I don't know, it got it got coveted or something. And there is also a documentary called Harry and Snowman. So, um, but no, the writer for life is still available. The rights are still available if anybody gets the end to make a movie out of it. It seems inevitable somebody will snap that up. Um, okay, I have a question from Jeremy. You talked about the America that may still be out there, the lost or rather hidden neighborliness. It mm -hmm. seems that he was riding at a time of nostalgia for a lost America and doing so in a way that was emblematic of what was lost. Was Annie aware of that um, in the same way that you were in telling her story? No, no. I mean, Annie, Annie um, was the more of a, almost more of a 19th century woman. And I think if you think about Maine and you think about a small town in Maine, um, and I think I do say this in the book, she was, she was much more at the tail end of the effects of the Great Depression than she was in the airplane age. So her family and this family farm, they had gotten a farm and then really it started to go down the skids in the Great Depression. She and her mother went off the farm to do factory work. This is classic in New England. That's what happened. And people kept holding on to the farms, holding on to the farms, holding on. Um, I bet you there's somebody in your audience right now who, who has something like that in their family. And it, right around the 1950s was when those family farms started to get lost. So when she rode off, she just didn't know what she was riding into. She was just being herself. That seemed normal to her. That was what she knew. And um, so, yeah, I don't think, I don't think she, I don't even think she would have really understood that she, she truly, she was a trusting person. Um, she believed in um, neighborliness. I mean, everything that I said, that's very much, that was very much true. And then, you know, and I said this earlier, I just want to reiterate though, there's no way for us to say that the 1950s were in fact better for all people because they were certainly much worse for some people. Um, you know, we lost some things and we gained some things. Um, but yes, I felt some sense of, I felt a sense of loss that we don't trust each other that much anymore. Even though I have to be honest with you, I trust pretty much everybody. So I'm just putting it out there. Yeah, that's great. Um, a question from uh, Charlene Mollerick. Do you have a favorite vignette from Annie's story that stayed with you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so you see my background, I live in Wyoming. And when I started writing Annie's book, I lived in Los Angeles. And I had to keep coming out to Wyoming a lot um, because it's sort of a center of the spoke in the middle. Was an e I have a friend who lives out here and it was kind of easy to get, you know, do these little short hops of her journey. And um, I really, I loved the scene where Annie, um, two scenes that were both, the, well, three really, that, that they all happened when she was in Wyoming. So one of them was when she got to ride in this big granddaddy of all parades. And she kind of had this moment where she felt, she went from, she used to feel kind of, I think when she started, she was sort of embarrassed or sheepish. You know, she hated to tell people that she was really going to California. So she'd sort of say, well, I'm just going to the next town over. Um, she was a little bit embarrassed. She hadn't really fully embraced it. So she rode in this parade and it was just this moment where she kind of thought, hey, I'm really doing this. Um, and then I guess really one of my favorite moments in the whole book is the moment where she is, um, she's riding, she's right, gonna ride up through the snowy range and, and the people in, in Wyoming are telling her she needs warmer stuff because it's gonna get cold and it's August and she's from Maine. So she's like, I know snow, like, I don't know what they're talking about. Um, and so she goes off and she rides, but uh, Laramie, Wyoming, which is actually near where I live now is, is at 7,500 feet. So she's gonna go up to an elevation of 10,000 feet. But actually she's already, she's at, actually already ascended quite a bit because it's a high plane. And so she when she finally gets to the summit, um, she's kind of like, oh, is this, is this all there is? Like, that wasn't that hard. Uh, but she doesn't know that one of the most desolate places in the entire country, which is the Red Desert, is what she has on the other side. Um, so I, 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 I think that was uh, Annie's experiences in Wyoming. I, maybe I just kind of, I, it was during the pandemic when I was writing that. And I think I just really connected to her in, in that moment. And then I moved to Wyoming too, so. 
She also turns down a marriage proposal in Wyoming. I don't want to give. She did. Yeah. I didn't even mention that, but that was also eventful. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Remarkable for uh, someone who has nothing, you know, other than what is on her back and her animals, because this guy is going to basically leave her all of his his his, uh, farm and everything. Yeah. Yeah. um, I didn't think for one minute though that she was going to. You know, people asked me that. They were like, "Do you do you think was was she right or wrong?" And I was like, "She wasn't going to because she was an independent woman." She was, and she was an independent woman and, and, and a kind of an iconoclast and had her own, her own deal. And, and in the end, she just wanted to do her own thing. Um, I don't think that I know what it feels like to be that constrained, to, to be born onto a farm and work from sunup to sundown and try to keep your family together for years and years and years. And then one day, no, she was like, no, I'm, I'm going out, I'm going out in a blaze of glory and nothing was gonna stop her. Um, I have a question from my uh, my friend Peter Moore. Um, you must come across cool stuff all the time as a historian. How do you pick something that will be worth five years of your attention? You come down, Brianna. Your next book. Yeah, it's such a great, great, great question. Um, because because a lot of a lot of stories that are so interesting are actually like what they call in the business oh, a do. magazine article. You know, it's like I think this is a magazine article. Um, so I. It, it's, you really have, there's got to be some meat there. You've got to have, there's got to be a story. There, you know, how I, how I perceive of it is there's the story about the people, or in my case, very often the people and the animals. And then there's the time around them. And you have to believe that the story about that person is going to illustrate something about the time around them that you can really build that world out in a way that's going to make you um, kind of understand the new world in a new way. And the other issue is sources. So sometimes you might have the best story in the world, but there just isn't enough meat. You, you know, you look into it and you just realize that, uh, you know, this is not historical fiction. You don't get to make things up. So you really have to believe that, that, that there's enough there. Because I also write fiction, sometimes those stories can make really great uh, subjects for historical fiction, where there's more places where you're just going to have to fill in the gaps um, with your imagination. But for nonfiction, yeah, I think, um, well, and the other thing too is, it's just, you have to be fascinated by it. You have to be continually fascinated that, um, you know, that you just don't get flagged and get bored of it because you're working on it for a long time. And I guess for me, one of the things about this Annie book is, um, I, my whole life, I would always be dry. I loved road trips and I would drive and I'd be driving through these places where it looked like nobody lived. And then there would be this one house. And I would think to myself, um, who lives there? What do they do? How do they support themselves? So writing this book about Annie got, got allowed me to go from small town to small town to small town and some big towns and some cities. And then, and like investigate that town and find out what people did there. And I thought that was really fun, so. Um. Question from, yeah, this, uh, we're going to have this be the last question um, from Charlene Malarek. Being a, being an equestrian yourself must have given you a unique view on Annie's story and journey. How did that inform your telling of the story? Um, I think that you could have told this story differently and, and focused it not so much on the animal human relationship, but I think uh, to me, that was the whole thing. I mean, she kept describing them as a team. They were her family, um, you know, and she didn't have any other family and those, those animals were her family. And so that to me, me being an equestrian, understanding how deep that relationship can be with your animals, I wanted to uh, really try to bring that to light. Um, And whenever I write about animals, I try to write about them as animals. I'm not really uh, one to want to sort of anthropomorphize and really turn them into people. But um, but yes, I think that I write about horses because I love horses and I write about horses because I find them endlessly interesting and I find our relationship with them endlessly interesting. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think that that, um, I think that brings us probably to, um, to about to close. Um, so Elizabeth and David, thank you both so much. This has been a fantastic conversation. Um, one of the things I hate about virtual events is there's no effective way to clap, but uh, <laughs> I assume everybody's clapping for you both. 
Um, and thanks to everybody who joined this evening and a special thanks to the MWPA for, for partnering with us on this. And um, if anybody needs a copy of the book, longfellowbooks.com or give us a call or come into the shop. Absolutely, please support independent bookstores and Longfellow's books in particular. Ari, thank you so much. Uh, this was a main story. And so when I, I heard that you had invited me, it really meant a lot to me because uh, you know, that's high praise indeed. You know, I know that you guys are the ones who, who kind of understand the heart of the story and where this person was coming from when she started. So that was great. And David, uh, that was great. I really enjoyed talking to you. And um, nice. it's always fun to, we could probably talk shop for hours just about what our process was. You, you never revealed your to me. So I'm going to come after you and find out. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I could keep going for sure. But thank you. Um, this is mm -hmm. great. Great conversation. It's a wonderful book, and I hope everybody picks it up. It's a great uh, summer vacation read the summer, and um, can't say enough about how uh, enjoyable it was to read. So, best of luck with it from here. Well, thank you. Thank you, all of you. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Yeah. Thanks, Ari. <laughs>